So, uh, good evening, all. Uh, thank you for joining in for today's Adda session. Uh, today, uh, we have uh, Cyan Roy uh, uh, from the 2016 batch uh, amongst us to give a talk on the topic Disentangling Quantum Entanglement. So, Cyan completed a BSMS in Physics from ISR Bhopal. At present, he is pursuing doctoral research at Saarland University, Germany in the theoretical quantum optics group. So today he will be talking us, uh, um, he will be talking on the topic of quantum physics, a topic that we all have grown up uh, fearing. So I think he will be able to demystify the topic for a lot of us. So uh, over to Sian, so you can start your presentation. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. So, so I, I share my screen first and then Can you see my screen? Yeah, it's very Okay. Uh, so thank you very much, Satyam, for this kind introduction. And uh, thanks, uh, first of all, thanks to the organizing committee for allowing me to speak here on this platform. And especially Ritesda for inviting and also keep pushing me to give this presentation. Uh, so this Praktani Atta, I think, is a very nice concept to me. and. It, it is really great to hear from a lot of seniors about their journeys uh, in different domains and their experience about how they have done the things. Also from academia, we have talked from, I think, Anupamda and also Pasadevda, who gave a lot of experience how they have, so who are now well established in their career and they have given a, and like inspiration to me, like how they have done this journey and the experience. So since I am also in the middle of this academic journey, so what I would like to share is that I would like to share the little knowledge that I have gained over the years about quantum computers. So I will tell you about quantum computing from very basics to technology. And this is my first time I'm giving a non technical talk so let's see how it goes and please feel free to interrupt me at any time whenever you want if you don't understand anything so without further delay i would like to start my presentation so so probably you have heard a lot about quantum computation or quantum information or quantum revolution from different news article and the, here is a, some snippets of very news article that is telling about quantum computer. So what I found interesting is that there are two different kinds of news articles. So one is the one that is telling that quantum computer is very supreme and it can do everything. But there are also a section of news article by some serious researcher who says that it has a, some kind of hype problem. So what I will do in this talk is to not clarify your doubt, but I will go through the basics of quantum computer and you will be the judge and say me that whether it's really have a high problem or it has something interesting in it. So let first go to, let first understand how our technology has progressed over the years, like over the last few decades. So here is the time axis. And you can see that during 1945, we have the first programmable computer that is called ENIAC. And it has a dimension of the whole room. And then fast forward to 2002, we had Pentium 4, which was uh, very, which is very much smaller and is like a few nanometer long and it is much faster than ENIAC. And coming to modern day mobile, we had like a, billions of transistor inside it and it is so super fast. So what is the basic idea is that as you go smaller, you become more faster and it also become much cheaper. So there is a good uh, empirical way to demonstrate this that is given by this Moore's law. So Gordon Moore in 1960s, he told that the number of transistor on microchips will double every two years. 
So you can see from 1970, it was like 1,000 transistor, and to 2020, you have like a much bigger number. And another way to understand this is like, if you if the number of transistor on a microchip is increasing, so you can say that the number of atoms per bit is decreasing because the trans the microchip's dimension is same, but the number of transistor is increasing. So what one should have is like, if you go in the 1960s, you have like 10 to the power 19 atoms per bit and Pentium 4 is like few million atom per bit. But a striking thing is that if you like extrapolate this curve, you can see that during 2017, we should have reached the limit of one atom per bit, but we had not achieved it. And this is because that if you go to the limit of this microscopic, a microscopic world, then this is quantum in nature. And here you cannot play the same game as you are playing with the transistor. So you have to change the game in certain manner. And that's why we had this challenge, like how one can use this atom to store and process information and like whether one can do it and then how one can do it. And then there is also opportunity that if one can do it, can you do it better than the classical computer. And in in the whole talk, I would like to say that I will describe you the basics of quantum computation and I will also present you the, the current technological status. So this brings me to the outline of my talk and I would first describe you the counterintuitive ideas of quantum mechanics that is from the superposition principle and also the entanglement principle. And then I will go briefly to the quantum computation part. And after that, I will go through platforms of quantum computation. And then I will present briefly what I am currently doing. So with this, I will first start with the, the counterintuitive ideas of quantum mechanics and the so first of all, we should understand like the physics is different at different time and length scale of the system. So here is an interesting cartoon that shows how different areas of physics is depends on different length scale and the speed. So here in the X axis, I have plotted the length of the system and on the Y, it is plotting the speed of the system. So what we are observing in our daily life mostly fall in the domain of classical mechanics. So that's what we see and everything you can explain with the with the theory of classical mechanics. Now, if you go to some higher length scale, then you go to the domain of astrophysics. And also if you go to the higher speed, like higher speed of the system, then you can be described by this relativistic mechanics. And I think the earlier talks Anupamda has told something about this uh, microorganism that is also described by classical mechanics. And I think uh, Basudevda has told something about neutrino physics. So it's mostly quantum field theory or relativistic mechanics. So today's topic, what I will do is to mostly go into this limit that is the microscopic nature. And I will talk about the theory of the atom and that is mostly described by quantum mechanics. And so the light and the matter at very microscopic scale, it follows the theory of quantum mechanics and the basic framework was developed over the last century and is still developing and by a lot of um, great renowned scientists. And uh, here I saw few of them who have got the Nobel prize and there are a long list of scientists. So without further delay, I let's dive into the key ideas of quantum mechanics. So. The first is the superposition principle. And so naively, if you think of electron, like if you don't know quantum mechanics, if you think naively what's the electron, you will think like it's like a point-like particle of microscopic size. But actually it is not. And it was famously shown by this double slit experiment. So let me first describe you the double slit experiment. So. If you take a classical particle, so here is a cartoon of, if it, there is a, a double slit in this plank and you take a bucket of sand and if you just pour onto it, 
So if sand being a classical particle, what will do? It will get heaped up on just below the two slits. And this is what you expect from uh, like our general knowledge that it will just go below and it will pile up here. But if you in like if you don't believe this cartoon, then there was a nice like small experiment which I found on Google that one man just put some salt and then there is two slit and you can see similar pattern that it gets just piled up just below the just below the two slits. Now, if you take a quantum particle, so what Bohr has predicted in 1920s that if you have like an electron shoot, so if you have a, like an electron gun, and then if you shoot through this two slit, you will observe some kind of interference pattern. And that can be only explained if one think the electron like a wave. So you can think the electron like a wave and then it goes through these two slits and then it interfere with each other and then it will give this interference pattern. Just similar to like if you throw two stones in a pond, then you can see that ripple like structure will interfere with each other and this, this will form this nice interference pattern. So coming back to nowadays, they also have done experiments on it and you can really see the same thing. So here one does is that one use, instead of electron, they use molecular beam, and then they pass it through two slit, and what they observe is some kind of interference pattern, and that is exactly what I have shown here. So you have this uh, middle maxima, and then there are like side maxima. And so if you compare this uh, interference pattern with this, you can see a lot of similarities. So from this experiments, what one can conclude is that that quantum particle can be thought of like it's like a superposition of wave like state. So it behaves like a wave. And another thing one is important is that it can be in two different position at the same time. So by this, I mean like if you have this interference pattern, it is just giving you the probability of observing the particle at that point. So let's say here you have a high probability of observing the particle, but here you have a very low probability. But the thing is that it can be in both the position, but only difference is it having different probability of observing there. So this is the concept number one that is of superposition. And then there is the concept number two that is of entanglement. And what is entanglement? So if I, if anybody asks me what is an entanglement and if I say I don't know quantum mechanics, then I would think of entanglement like a earphone. So the earphone getting entangled with, with his own wire, when wire. And strikingly, this has a very similarity, like very good similarity with quantum entanglement. And that is like, what is the problem here is that it is very difficult to extract the two ends of earphone. Similarly, in a quantum entanglement, if you think of this abstract picture as our quantum system and the polygon as its different part, so what is here is that it is non-trivially correlated with each other. So each of the part is very non-trivially correlated. And the information about a very single part is not content only on that part. It is somehow spreaded over the system. So one have to see what how the system behaves, but you cannot individually say that this circle behave like this. And this is what the notion of quantum entanglement is. So, so with these two concept, so is the main framework which quantum computer relies on and this brings me to the next part of the talk. But before going there, I will stop just to clarify if there is some questions, like a very urgent question. Mm -hmm. I think so, I you can continue and then we, we can take the questions at last. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Okay, so now what I will do is like I, I have explained you the concept of quantum computer uh, quant, uh, quant superposition and entanglement, and now I will see show you how quantum computer works. So, what is a quantum computer? So, 
the quantum computer aims at taking advantage of this superposition and entanglement principle and it it solves some problem exponentially faster than a classical computer so this is what the overall aim of a quantum computer is and i will explain you how it is so so first let's talk about basic fundamental block of a computer so a, a normal computer the fundamental block is called the bits and it's like a binary digit so you have zero or one and this can be easily realized by a transistor in a switch off position or switch on position and after that you perform some logical operation and that is given by this logical gate and then you get some output that is deterministic in nature so by deterministic i mean like you can determine from the input what will be the output of that logical gate and this how you design the algorithm and this is what every task in our computer we are doing can be explained by this simple phenomena now actually quantum computer also uses similar logic and instead of bits they just have qubits so here qubits is like you have the zero then one but in addition to do you also have the superposition state and then you perform the same operation like logical gates or you term that unitary gate and then you get some output but here the output is probabilistic in nature because of the superposition principle so since you have a probability that you observe the particle with probability a in zero state and you observe the particle in one state with probability b square so that's why it's probabilistic in nature so that is the main difference between these bits and qubits and so if from here i think it's not so clear that why qubit has advantage because it's just only three state instead of two so i will explain in the next slide why it is more advantage here so let go through it by some example so let's suppose you have some bits so let's suppose you have 10 bits and like what you can do with this 10 bits so for example you have i have taken the very simple example like all the bits are zero and this just stores the value single value like zero and so what you can do with 10 bits is like a, you can store a single value between zero and two to the power 10 but now if you take like 10 non-entangled qubit so as i have explained if you have yeah, non-entangled if you have non-entanglement in the qubits then you can explain every part separately so here so just forget about this notice and just think of like this first part is the qubit one the second part is qubit two and it will go on for the 10 qubits and what you can do with this 10 non-entangled qubit you can store 20 values because each qubit can store two values like here a1 and b1 qubit 2 can store a2 and b2 and it will go or so on so with only superposition you can see that it is performing much better than 10 bits and now if you take entangled qubit then it becomes more powerful so like with entangled qubit you cannot describe each qubit individually you have to describe the whole system together so you have to take all the possible combination of 0 and 1 for the 10 qubits and you have to write the, all the superposition state and so this can be so you can store like 2 to the power 10 values and that is like equivalent to 1 lakh 31 thousand bits which is like 16 kilobytes of memory so we can see that with only 10 b qubits you can perform much better than 10 bits and to give you an, an estimate so if you take only 500 entangled qubit and that will be like 2 to the power 500 values and that is much greater than the number of estimated atom in our entire universe so this concludes that the quantum computer is powerful and another thing is that no known classical algorithm can simulate a quantum computer so because you cannot create something using all the atoms in universe that is impossible thing so with only a few qubits you can manage that level of computation but here to give you a disclaimer that it's powerful but we should understand how powerful it is so this we should ask like how powerful a quantum computer is so let's 
it's very nicely shown in this figure. Just forget about what is written here. Just think of this green square as like uh, the set of all problems in the universe. And this red circle is the problem that is efficiently solved by a classical computer. Now, what quantum computer can do is to solve problems that are within this red circle. And along with that, it can also solve that are within this purple curve. And that is the that is the domain in which quantum computer is useful. And you can see that it clearly contained all the part that classical computer can also do. And now, so, but we should keep in mind that it cannot solve all the problems in the universe, but it can solve only a section of all the problem, but that is more than a classical computer. So with this, I would just give you a brief um, potential application, brief on potential application of quantum computer. So there are few of them. So first one is like you can use a quantum computer to understand chemical structure and different chemical processes. And that will be a very huge help in the academia. Also, you can use it to design new quantum materials and that is the drug designing and you can design it using the pharmaceutical or agricultural industry. And you can also use it for network optimization thing and that will be huge help in logistic or in finance. Also in cryptography and also in the accelerating the training time of AI. So currently there is a problem that the training time for artificial intelligence algorithms are too long. So you can accelerate it using a quantum computer. And these are only few of the potential application and there are a lot more. And especially in the physics, you can also do like understand the physics of low temperature and so on. So these are the potential application. Now one should, so I tell you about what is a quantum computer does and what are the opportunities. Now one should ask the question how one should do it. So we should see what are the quantum hardware or like what are the platforms in which quantum computing can be done. So, so to realize quantum computers, so for the first thing we should understand like how one can realize this. So if you, so here I have plotted uh, emission spectra of some atoms. So think of this like you have a hydrogen molecule and then you ionize it and then you let it uh, spread, let it emit its spectra. Then what you see, it doesn't emit light of every frequency, but it emits light of certain frequencies only. And it is different for different atoms. So the helium has a different frequencies and neon has different and etc. So, and this model can be well explained by this Bohr model of atom, which says that the atoms are quantum in nature and they have this discrete energy level. So you can describe this as like you have energy level of ground state, then the first excited, the second excited and so on. And it is discrete in nature. And because of this discreteness, so this each energy gap corresponding to correspond to each frequency in which it emits the light. Another thing to note is that they are not equally spaced. So that's why I'm calling it as anharmonic. And because of this, one can isolate two of the state and can resemble this as qubit. So this is the main idea of how you can use it in different platforms. So how you can realize different platforms. So I will only tell you about two of them, but there are a lot more where you have the, the main concept behind it is the same. So the first platform I will talk about is the ion trap quantum computer. And this rely on the difference. So they, they will trap, trap the ion and they will rely on different energy state of this electrically charged atom or the ion to use it as a quantum computer. So as I have, shown in the previous picture that you have two different level and then you use this as your qubit and then you perform all the operation. So here I have shown a picture of, of, of an atom trapped in these electrodes and like the physics behind this is very simple and it is like uh, the like charges will repel each other and the uh, opposite charges attract each other. So it is based on that principle, you can trap a single atom. 
and similarly you can trap uh, multiple atom also and here is a fluorescence what you have fluorescence of that atom you are seeing here and from outside it just looks like a chip so this is what the ion trap quantum computer does and they have now like five qubits and 20 qubits set up in their different lab and recently last week i have a con i was in a conference and there they saw they said that they are now building 50 qubit setup and probably release by the starting of the next year and another platform that i think is more heard of is the superconducting qubit and that is mostly by these big companies like ibm google they are implementing it and they also work on similar concept but they have a instead of the atom or ion they have a superconducting qubit that is a, that is like you have a superconducting lc circuit that is the nonlinear inductor part and this is the capacitor part and what you can see is that they the electromagnetic energy in this circuit is also quantum in nature and you have like different unequally spaced energy level so here also you can utilize two of this unequally spaced level and you can use it as qubit. And this is exactly what is done here. So here you have uh, the qubits implemented at this LC circuit, and then you use this chip to compute various quant things. And this chip is just kept here. So this is very uh, small in size, but this whole chandelier type of thing is just to maintain the temperature. So because the superconducting material works in like uh, 16 few mill millikelvin so that's why you have to maintain this temperature so this whole thing is just to maintain the temperature at 15 millikelvin and all the computation are done in a very small thing and with this i like to say that okay so we have uh, different platforms we have everything so why we are not getting any practical advantage so there is something that is creating problem and what is this problem so as i have told earlier that what a quantum circuit look like so it have this qubits and then you perform the gate and then you perform measurement and that's how you get the output but the problem is that you have an error in every step so you have an error while initializing the qubit then you have error while performing the gate operation and you have also error while doing the measurement. So, so what are the ingredients that we need at the same time is like, we want to control the qubits, like we want to control the qubits, we want to control the gate operation and everything. But at the same time, we also want to scale it to higher number of qubits. But this is somehow they go against each other. That is like, if you want to control the number of qubits, if you want to control the qubits perfectly, then you you are only restricted to few qubits. And if you are going to scale up, then you are like compromising with the controllability of the qubit. But nowadays people are also working in the domain of quantum error correction, why where they are trying to make this thing more fault tolerant. And to give you an example, what this Google AI team they have done is and they claimed it as like quantum supremacy they, there it is like they have this sycamore chip which consists of 53 qubits but it can perform only 20 gate operation so to get any practical advantage you have to go at least up to few hundred qubits and also few hundred gate operation and then only you can get some practical advantage and why they claim it as quantum supremacy because the 20 gate operation they have done in few minutes that can be simulated in a classical computer but it will take like a few days or few weeks of time so with this i would like to give you a brief summary of what i have explained so that is like so quantum computing is a different type of computer it's not exactly work in the same principle as a classical computer does and currently we are in the era of quantum discovery so a lot of things will be discovered and a lot of there are a lot of potential application i have mentioned only a few of them so there is the current problem of scaling up and controllability and hopefully one will find a good quantum error correction algorithm and probably with that we would 
build bigger and better quantum machine and that will help in our future so this was more or less my the this part of the talk and then i just i will give you a brief of what i am currently doing so i mostly worked in the fundamental part of quantum mechanics so i do not work in this application areas so so the one of the topic that i am more interested in is this like how this collective behavior of this microscopic particle behaves so you if you have many body quantum system then how you can observe collective or cooperative behavior so we recently published this article in this physical review a and the main motivation of the work was more like if you have a system and if you have an environment just like you have in a quantum system and quantum computer and the environment then if you interact with environment then it gives some decoherence effect and by decoherence i mean it gives some error in the system and that destroys all the quantum property so what we try to do is to like somehow preserve the quantum property by somehow engineering this interaction so this is a very abstract model in which we worked and here you have this a and b as our system and this red circles they are like our environment and then i interact it in such a way so that in with time this becomes entangled so initially i start with no entanglement and then i use the property of the environment to make it entangled so i showed in this picture so on the y axis you have uh, some merits of entanglement and on the x axis you have the time and you can see that initially they started with no entanglement and then it oscillates between fully entangled and no entangled and depending on this interaction strength you observe different behavior and this we have explained why this is happening theoretically in our model so this is one of the part that i worked on and then currently i am also work in something called like the search strategy by quantum work and this is originally inspired from a random work so you can think of random walk like a, a drunk man is walking on a road and how he is walking he don't know which way to go so he just walk randomly now one can use this random walk as a search problem so you you can give a search target and you can say like what is the probability that when this drunk person will like get this target so we just want to do the same thing but instead of a drunk man we use the quantum particle and we want to see how it behaves and and okay so this problem of random walk has a very nice story behind it so that is like at that time in 1905 you can ask question to the journal and you can just post question in in the nature article and say like i don't know the answer of this can anybody can anybody help me so Carl Pearson was the guy who faced the problem of random walk and Lord Rayleigh answered it and the gist of this answer is that the most pro probable place to find a drunken man is near his starting point so basically he will not move anywhere so okay so coming back to my work is that what i do is that if we have the classical particle and a quantum particle and then i compare the both and i will plot the total detection probability that in which like the particle will observe the target and this is the time steps it takes so what i think what i saw is that the classical algorithms performs better than the than the quantum one but there is a initial time frame in which quantum one is doing better so what we do we design algorithm such a ways to take advantage of this particular part and then with this algorithm we see that it performs better than the classical one also and now what we are trying is to understand the law of different lattice structure and to give you an analogy of the lattice structure so by lattice structure i mean it's the type of road this person is walking so is it uneven or is it having some hilly area or some valley and how the how that different circumstances will help in the speed up or help in the search or it it gives some disadvantage to the search 
So this is another part which I am currently working and there is another similar type of thing, but this is like a quantum search strategy in a graph, but here we are not doing it randomly. So here the problem is more like, let's say you have a graph of six vertex and then you want to identify which, which you want to find that the second vertex, which is red in color. So classically, if you think like how one can I search this second vertex, you will go through every vertex and then you will find that this is the this is the one with the red color. And this typically takes n steps, but with quantum algorithms, you can do, and it was shown by Grover that you can go to this square root n steps. And now we are trying to see that with, with different graphs, how this search strategy helps. So can we get to a speed up that is more than square root of n or does uh, something that uh, don't benefit the search strategy? So these are the two platforms that I am currently working. And so this is a brief of my work and these are the people with whom I work on. So this is uh, my group and I. this is my supervisor, Professor Johanna Moriji. And this is the part of big project that I am part of. And that is also called TRR of the Kukolima. And it is funded by the German Research Foundation. So with this, I also want to thank everybody for your attention. And before that, I also like to thanks my other family, that is the Bidavit family, which is in Europe. So we we meet quite often in different parts of Europe and we share emotional uh, thought and hopefully we'll do it more and more and hopefully there will be more reunions. So these are some pictures. You can see Ritesda also Saknikta and many more. So with this, I would like to end by a very nice uh, uh, quote by Ahmed Mustak that Pata ab tak nahi vatla hamara, wahi ghar hai, wahi kissa hamara. So with this, I like to thanks and I am open for any question. Uh, thank you, Sam. Thank you so much. Uh, I, you said it is your first public presentation, but I think it was very well delivered. So uh, very well done. Uh, thank uh, you. So, uh, so the uh, platform is open for any questions or queries or comments that you have regarding the topic or in general you would ask sign uh, to respond to so in case you have any questions you can unmute yourself and then ask uh, so uh, before anybody starts so let me just ask one question for the benefit of all the listeners who are listening or maybe would listen uh, in future so what inspired you or motivated you to take up this topic and how this journey of studying quantum physics actually uh, took place so can, if you could just uh, the motivation behind this topic if you could uh, shed some light on that oh, okay so uh, so the initial motivation of taking physics comes from the school time, like when Nandida and uh, Jiaulda, like from class 11, 12, I started liking physics as a subject and then I thought of pursuing it. And then when I come to college, I, and I started learning different uh, areas of physics, so mainly the classical and the statistical physics. So initially, I also didn't work on quantum type of thing. I mainly worked in classical type of physics. So so one easy example would be like if you think of uh, anything that is colored in your thing, so if you think like a single atom will have no color, but your table has some color. So how these th things happened? So the, there is something that is like a statistical property or like a collective behavior that gives you this color type of phenomena. So these are the small phenomena that inspired me to take a, like something of like a statistical physics kind of thing. And then what I studied during my college was like something like flocking of parts where you have like many parts flock each other and giving some emergent behavior. And then this inspired me to take like, what are the different collective behavior that you can observe also in the microscopic scale. And 
that led me to pursue my PhD in this quantum topic. So, so I mainly work in the domain of like the mixture of quantum mechanics and statistical physics. So statistical physics just means that it has more number of particles. So this is all what all inspired me to oh. to take these topics. Yes. So then, yeah. Uh, Pritesh has pointed that we have two people more uh, in the audience working in science and research. So Devanjan and Sagnik. So in case you have any anything to add to the presentation, then I guess you might. Uh, uh, so Devanjan and Sagnik, in case you would like to uh, add anything to the presentation. Uh, I don't know if they are. Uh, correct. Yeah, yeah. So firstly, thank you very much, Sayon. Very nice, very clear presentation. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you are more experienced than I am. So. <laughs> no, 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 no. So, like, um, it's very interesting how uh, you were talking about the quantum uh, computer and, like, I think it's still a little bit in the future, probably. So, what do you think about the, like, the time scale in which we can expect a uh, working quantum computer or something like that? Because the example that you showed probably the quantum supremacy from Google, Google or yeah, yeah, uh, Google, something. yes, Google. So probably that was meant for a very specific problem, right? Or yeah, they they are just performing the simple logical operation, and they are seeing that whether it can perform it faster so or one computer specific for a problem is probably easier to make, but like a general computer for many problems. It's quite difficult. So, what what would you say about this? So, currently, though, whatever device we had in different platform is much restricted to fewer number of qubits, or even if they have like more qubits, it's not error free. So, you have to mm. always take in mind the like how much error you are performing. So. So like possibly the, in the next decades, there will be some fault tolerant quantum computer where it will be error free, but nobody knows like how much time it will take. So at the moment, what people are trying is to use this current setup and use it as a uh, like some kind of like hybrid quantum classical type of architecture, uh, quantum classical type of algorithm so that they can perform something better. Yeah, it's amazing. Like, how there are so many quantum algorithms already existing, but mm -hmm. the um, the machine on which we can perform these algorithms is so limited. Yeah, so limited. Yes, that's that's true. So, for example, I can I I think I have one backup slide. Yes. Yeah. So. I think I I can. This is one of the recent work that I found from this uh, so this is still in the free print so it's it's mm -hmm. like a autonomous autonomous car driving type of uh, uh, network so this is a reinforcement learning network but what is important is that this is mostly done by classical computer this can be done easily by classical computer but the training time it takes takes like a weeks or something so what mm -hmm. people does is like he changed one part of this architecture to a quantum circuit. So that is, it prepared the state using the quantum circuit and it it still uses the classical optimization. And then the result it found it, it is amazing. That is, it is performing much quicker than the, than the only classical one. So this red curve, so things, think of Y axis as some kind of merit of uh, accuracy and this episode is the time in which it, mm -hmm. it takes. So you can see the red curve always outperform this blue curve, and this red curve like already converts to the solution in two thousand steps, where the the blue one takes like six thousand or something. What is the what is the red and the blue curve? So red curve is the one one with the quantum algorithm. Like you have okay. the circuit with quantum and quantum plus classical, and the blue mm -hmm. curve is the one only with the classical optimization. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the application that people are doing, and the other one is like using a quantum simulator. So that is, you can use 
different uh, materials too. So you don't compute anything, but you try to understand what is the physics behind it. So this is another mm -hmm. domain where people are working. So you can understand the many body low temperature physics. So yeah. These are the, the recent application that people are trying to do. And probably if you have a quantum computer, then you can do it better. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. So for me, I hope like by the next decade, I think we will have some yeah, progress. Yeah, I think it's a very, very active field of research currently. And yeah. also there is so much funding from uh, big companies as well. So Yeah, so uh, <laughs> yeah, also there was a recent news from uh, IBM that they will stop building uh, qubits, uh, like so stop building uh, higher qubits quantum computer, but they will more focus on the error correction, like better quantum yeah. machine. Yeah, yeah. So I think, uh, yeah. Yeah, probably it, it's everything is in the right direction. And yeah. hopefully in our lifetime, we get to see a quantum computer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah like some practical advantage. Yes, that's what. That yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Ah, uh, yeah, welcome. Uh, any anybody else has to something to add? Uh, if I think uh, that's all uh, from the audience. So uh, I think uh, we all had a very productive session today, and I I, I know this is a technical topic, and uh, for someone like me who is who, who studies science long back, I think more than a decade back, it it. It did not make sense at some points of time, but again, this is a good introductory lecture. If somebody would like to dig in deeper, then I think that's a good base that the session has provided. So uh, with all that, I would like to thank Sian once again for your time and your effort for this session. And I hope, we hope to continue the session. Uh, we have monthly ADA sessions here. So uh, we will bring new topics and new speakers going forward. And thank you all for joining uh, today. So uh, we, we can call it a day. But thank you all. Uh, thank you very much. So bye. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.